All right, great. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Center for Effective Government for co-organizing this event with us uh, and for their really excellent report. Um, and I'd like to thank all of the panelists for being here and everyone in the room and everyone on the webcast. So thanks for your participation. Um, there's a lot of really interesting events that are happening this week in honor of Sunshine Week. Uh, I'd encourage you to check out the sunshineweek.org event calendar. Um, several of the other organizations here in this room, OpenTheGovernment.org, Cato, uh, National Security Archives, Center for Effective Government are all going to be participating um, in panels during this week. So definitely check out the event calendar. Um, national security is easily the most challenging area for transparency, as illustrated in this report and as illustrated in numerous recent news stories. Finding that balance is something that is very challenging. Um, some of the problems discussed in this report and some of the problems that we're going to discuss today are overclassification, the state secrets doctrine, uh, secret law, the OLC memos, uh, for instance, drones and wiretapping. We at EPIC actually have a case going back to 2006 on the warrantless wiretapping issue. It's the oldest active Freedom of Information Act litigation that we have, and it just continues to draw on. Um, the over-aggressive FOIA litigation stances by the Department of Justice, uh, problematic new FOIA regulations that we've seen come out of the Department of Justice, um, agency resistance to transparency. Uh, recently it was in the news that the NSA was asked by members of Congress to report on uh, how many people it was surveilling and it said that that would in fact violate people's privacy just to tell Congress how much surveillance it was engaging in. Um, and a lack of political will toward transparency. So these are the challenges that we're facing. Uh, we're going to hear more on the challenges and on the solutions uh, from our panelists here. We have a really great expert panel, uh, Steve Aftergood. Um, Steve is a senior research analyst at the Federation of American Scientists. He directs the FAS project on government secrecy, which works to reduce the scope of government secrecy and to promote reform in official secrecy practices. He writes Secrecy News, which is an excellent report uh, on new developments in secrecy policy, and he provides direct public access to official records of policy value that have been suppressed, withdrawn, or are simply hard to find. In 1997, Mr. Aftergood was the plaintiff in a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit against the Central Intelligence Agency, which led to the declassification and publication of the total intelligence budget, uh, $26.6 billion in 1997, for the first time in 50 years. In 2006, he won a FOIA lawsuit against the National Reconnaissance Office for release of unclassified budget records. Mr. Aftergood is an electrical engineer by training, uh, and he's published research in solid state physics. He joined the FAS staff in 1989. Tom Blanton is the director of the National Security Archive at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Blanton served as the archive's first director of planning and research beginning in 1986, um, and he's been the executive director since 1992. He filed his first Freedom of Information Act request in 1976 in a weekly news, as a weekly newspaper reporter in Minnesota. Uh, and among many hundreds subsequently, he filed a FOIA request and subsequent lawsuit with Public Citizen Litigation Group that forced the release of Oliver North's Iran Contra Diaries in 1990. Mr. Blanton is a graduate of Harvard, Harvard University. Uh, he's the found, a founding editorial board member of FreedomInfo.org, the virtual network of international freedom of information advocates. Jim Harper is the Director of Information Policy Studies at Cato. Uh, Jim works to adapt law and policy to the unique problems of the information age in areas such as privacy, telecommunications, intellectual property, and security. Mr. Harper was a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security's Data Privacy and Integrity Advisory Committee, and he recently co-edited the book, Terrorizing Ourselves, How the U.S. Counterterrorism Policy is Failing and How to Fix It. He's been cited and quoted by new, new, numerous print, internet, and television media outlets. Um, and he's the editor, editor of Privacilla.org, a web-based think tank devoted exclusively to privacy. He holds a JD from UC Hastings College of Law. Scott Rosenthal is a legislative aide to Senator Merkley uh, and has worked under Senator Merkley on reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, that, that reforms of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that promote oversight and accountability for the act. Scott has worked as a legislative aide to Senator Merkley since Senator Merkley was first elected in January 2009. From 2009 to 2010, Scott focused primarily, primarily on Senator Merkley's banking committee assignment and the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill. Since 2011, Scott has advised Senator Merkley on a number of policy areas, 
including legislation before the Senate Judiciary and Intelligence Committees. Scott is a graduate of Cornell University. So with that, we're going to get started with our distinguished panel. Uh, we'll just go <coughs> down the line to my left, uh, starting here with Tom Lynn. Thanks very much, Ginger, and thanks all on the web and here. Um, I want to make just five uh, quick points in this time. Uh, one of them is that President Obama has made some truly historic <coughs> national security openness decisions, um, and he gets no credit for that, and I'll try to explain why. The historic national security openness decisions that he's made are to declassify, for example, the nuclear stockpile to declassify routinely the national intelligence budget that Steve Aftergood used to have to sue to get it released, which we only succeeded doing what, twice. Um, he, President Obama issued exactly as open government advocates had long uh, argued a fundamental declassification review order, which actually jumped a whole bunch of really obsolete classification guides. President Obama ordered the declassification of the torture memos from the Office of Legal Counsel that the Bush administration had fought for years to hide. Uh, President Obama ordered the declassification of the warrantless wiretapping inspector general's report, without which we would really not know much of anything about what had actually <coughs> happened under that surveillance. Um, and there are a variety of decisions like that that are truly historic, that he deserves a ton of credit for, um, but he gets none. And I'll say there, my second point is there are really a couple of reasons why President Obama gets no credit for these historic national security open decisions. One of them is that the decisions just haven't worked their way down into the bureaucracy. So that we still see Department of Energy reviewers and Department of Defense reviewers censoring out nuclear stockpile information from 30 and 50 years ago, even though the current numbers are all I'm sorry, that's open to the public. What is possibly damaging national security about those numbers, right? The president's decisions about national security openness, <coughs> foreseeable harm, presumption of, of disclosure, have not filtered their way at all into the Department of Justice's litigation posture. So you see attorneys standing up there, like Steve just wrote up in his blog that I read this morning, a Justice Department attorney just defended the trade representative to try to withhold a document that a federal judge looked at and said, this doesn't deserve to be classified. And yet justice is out there defending really obsolete notions of national security secrecy, claiming, oh, it's precedent. What's actually happened is the career lawyers just haven't gotten the word. And I think the other reason that President Obama gets no credit for these historic national security openness decisions is that the Justice Department has prosecuted more leakers using the club of the Espionage Act than all the previous administrations put together. I think the count is now up to about seven. Um, and this is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary step forward. I was very happy to see in the report by the Center for Effective Government the denunciation of the use of the Espionage Act when actually there should be administrative penalties. The government does have the right to run a national security classification system with clearance process and the like. It does have the right to, to have some order in that system, not willy-nilly information disclosure. But using the Espionage Act to pursue a former linguist who happens to retain classified documents for the purposes of building a collection at the Hoover Institution this is an outrage. It's even more of an outrage to prosecute under the Espionage Act a whistleblower like Thomas Drake or, or threaten prosecution one like Thomas Tam who blew the whistle and warm was wire tamping. But when you have your Justice Department out there doing this, you've convinced every newsroom in America that this administration is conducting a war on whistleblowers. That's the phrase they use. So the President's not going to get any credit for his national security openness, even though I would argue um, it's historic. Um, I could go on on the whistleblower front because what the President did to try to protect whistleblowers, I think enormously commendable. But I think the third point I want to get to is I think the headline um, today about classification declassification is that the agencies are essentially in revolt against the president and will not and willfully will not meet his set deadline in his executive order from December 2009 to get rid of the 400 million page backlog of records that should have been released in the Clinton years and got held up because of some I think bad moves by Congress. The Kyle Watt Amendment has long outlived its usefulness, if it ever had one, causing a multiple re-reviews for looking for, for obscure uh, 
nuclear weapons, actually location and policy information is the bulk of what they find in Kyle Watt. Yet the taxpayers have spent tens of millions of dollars on this review in a kind of a permanent full employment program for Department of Energy secure crafts, unfortunately. Um, that's only one of the factors, but the reality is the National Declassification Center was tasked with getting rid of the backlog. They had a deadline of December 2013. They will not meet it. In fact, they will only get, get maybe halfway, I think, by the latest numbers. This is an absolute abject failure. They had four years to do it, couldn't do it. There are reasons why, but one of the main ones is that the historic policy changes at the top are not being applied in the middle, and the agencies deliberately disobeyed the president's order in the executive order and in the memo from the Information Security Oversight Office to segregate groups of records not likely to include nuclear information and treat those as groups and release them. Instead, the agencies have insisted on line by line, page by page, which is obsolete, which we can't afford anymore, which we'll never be able to sustain, particularly as the avalanche of electronic records comes down the pipe. Um, so, given that context, my fourth point is simply that the current recommendations that are on the table just don't go far enough. The Public Interest Declassification Board report was useful, but it didn't go nearly far enough. We will not solve our problem until we stop page by page and line by line review and move to risk managed whole groups of records. We won't solve our problem in the future unless we put a self canceling classification on every new secret with a date certain for when it comes out, because otherwise we're stuck in a review process in the middle of an exponential expansion of records that have to be reviewed. Um, and I think we will not get out of our trap until the Public Interest Declassification <coughs> Board has the power or a board like it, a board like it, maybe a few steroids like it, um, has the power to actually order the release of records, like the Kennedy Assassination Records Board did, to really force the intelligence agencies to pony up and recognize historic records do not, do not pose dangers to national security. So my last point is there are some immediate tests, I think, in 2013 for the Obama administration on national security secrecy, which we should all take a look at and see if they pass or not. Number one would be the drone memos. Finally, the targeting legal memos about drones have been provided to the intelligence committees after the Obama administration refused to do it over years. Now, those of us who watch from the outside saw the progression of an internal debate with people like Harold Coe at the State Department arguing for full disclosure on those memos and other people in the intelligence committee arguing not. I mean, you had a drip and a drab of a little bit of disclosure over a series of about eight speeches, I think, cited by the judge in the January uh, New York decision. Um, that, I think that debate is coming to a conclusion, partly driven by the John Brennan nomination process, partly driven by Senator Merkley and others who are pushing on the hill for the kind of disclosure that should have been there from the beginning, and that President Obama actually embraced around the torture memos. He should embrace the same level of openness around these memos. That's test one. Test two would be the Senate Select Committee of Intelligence 6,000 page report on the torture program. Um, it's supposed to be, according to Chairman, Chairwoman Feinstein and others, an evisceration of claims that torture ever produced any uh, useful information in the war on terror. But it's now sitting at the CIA because Congress willfully allows its decisions about classification declassification to be run by agencies. I personally think there's a separation of powers issue. If the Senate Intelligence Committee wanted to release that document, they could. But there's a bit of comedy between the branches, and they want to let the reviewers have their way. Comedy I'm, with a T. Comedy with a T. <laughs> <laughs> comedy, and sometimes. Uh, Senator know. Trent Lott commented about, I think, the, the, the Senate investigation of 9-11, which they sent to the CIA for review and it came back 90% deleted. And uh, Senator Lott said, you know, it would be ridiculous if it wasn't so tragic, <laughs> right? So I hope that doesn't happen. Third, I think, test will be, will the administration produce a report on its use of the state secrets privilege? It did only one two years ago to Senator Leahy. It said how many times it used it, on which basis, um, how many of those got referred to inspectors general. It actually provided some accountability on a totally separate <coughs> area. Will they produce that new report? I would love them to go further, obviously, and stop using state secrets as anything other than an evidentiary privilege, not a neutron bomb to leave no plaintiff standing, but rather just simply uh, evidence, force evidence out. We'll see. Will there be a report? We don't know yet. I think, uh, and the fourth test will be, will they actually take the various recommendations, the fact that the system is broken, that the National Declass Center will fail as of December, and actually start a process to look at more fundamental reforms to classification and declassification. That's a test. This year is it. Um, let's see. Thanks. Um, 
Thanks, Tom. I'm in substantial agreement with what uh, my friend Tom Blanton said. Um, let me give you a slightly different perspective. Um, I, I think it's a little bit too neat to say that the agencies are in revolt against the White House because the White House. It's a great phrase. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great phrase. But unfortunately, the White House um, itself has not been a perfect exemplar of the President's declared policies. It has weakened its own ability to lead um, by, by not embodying the values it says that it um, uh, embraces. Think about uh, a category of records called presidential policy directives. They're fundamental documents by which the president makes things happen in the executive branch. Most presidential policy directives, including most unclassified policy directives, are not available on the White House website. Uh, they're simply not. Uh, last Friday, Lisa Elman uh, blogged that she had put up PPD-19 on whistleblower protection, which is very nice. Uh, but PPD-1 is not there. Like I said, most unclassified directives are not there. The White House could, you know, it's not a question of culture change. It's not a question of trying to get some agencies to change their practices. It's a question of, do you believe this? If you believe it, then this afternoon, put all the unclassified directives online. Uh, put summaries, even brief ones, of the unclassified ones up. Do it. Communicate to the agencies not through speeches, not through memos, but by example. Show them what you expect to be done. And um, they are doing that. Unfortunately, they're showing that uh, what they expect is a sort of um, incomplete, partial, symbolic compliance with, with the stated values. And that's, um, you know, if, if, they want to, if they want to lead change, there are opportunities to do so within the White House, and they still need to do that. Part of the reason that, that you know, all of the things that, that Tom listed are, are true, um, uh, all, there have been historic changes made by the Obama administration. There hasn't been as much credit as, as they uh, merit, but there have also been all kinds of crazy failures that are, that are uh, hard to understand. Um, the, the white paper on targeted killing of suspected terrorists who are American citizens was not released by the administration. It leaked to NBC News. And then you had the bizarre uh, scene of the White House press spokesman saying, you know, it's out there. You really should go read it. Uh, it's out there because it's leaked and, it was, and, and the administration had refused to release it. So there, there are some, they really need to get their house in order and their policies in order so that their practice matches um, their uh, uh, principles. Um, you know, in a sentence, I mean, the key insight I've sort of come to over time is that I don't believe the, the administration is being uh, hypocritical or disingenuous when it, when it declares its support for openness. I think the, the issue rather is that these principles and these policies are not self-executing. Saying them does not make them happen. Saying them is an invitation to struggle over them. And I think we had a, a sort of science experiment last week um, uh, that, that illustrates uh, the, the issue. Um, the, how, the, the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate Judiciary Committee both said, we really want these darn Office of Legal Counsel memoranda on targeted killing. The Intelligence Committee got them. The Judiciary Committee did not get them. And it's possible to ask, well, why? What's going on there? And I think there, there are probably more than one answer but the, the answer that jumps out at me is that the Senate Intelligence Committee, although both committees had been struggling for more than a year to get the memos, the Intelligence Committee was willing to flex its muscles and said there's going to be a problem with the confirmation of Mr. Brennan unless you give us what we want. Senator Leahy, to whom everyone who can, you know, cares about open government owes a debt of gratitude, was not willing to flex muscles. He was willing to write a letter. 
when the letter was not, did not elicit a satisfactory response, he was willing to write another letter. But that's, that's as much as he was willing to do, and I think that <coughs> explains why he does not have the memoranda that the Intelligence Committee has. So, um, you know, nothing is going to happen by itself. Um, and and uh, um, all of our, you know, none of us can sit on our hands. All of us who care about these things need to fight over them. The good news is that there are things that work. There are things that, that, that bring about change. And in the Obama administration, the ground for potential change is more uh, fertile and auspicious than it has been in many years. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do to learn about what works. Um, the ice cap works. Uh, the interagency security classification appeals panel, at least on a on a on a uh, uh, microcosmic scale, um, uh, leaks work in some sense. Uh, the the white paper leaked. That was a very effective. You know, it broke a logjam that could not be broken any other way. Um, we need a better understanding of the tools that we have, and I think we're also going to need to develop and establish new tools and new structures. Um, we're never, it's never going to be possible to persuade the CIA to be different than it is. What will be necessary is to take the dis disclosure decisions out of the exclusive hands of the CIA and make them either subject to a kind of uh, independent board or to some other process that, um, that uh, imposes independent impartial review on uh, decisions to uh, uh, release or withhold. Uh, the most, there are lots of problems with the classification system. To me, the biggest problems are not the volume, the growing volume of secret material or the growing backlogs of material awaiting declassification. The biggest problem is the boundaries. What are the boundaries between what is classified and what can be disclosed? Those boundaries, I believe, are in the wrong place and we need new mechanisms to shift them. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> I, re I really wish I knew enough to call the right answer between Tom's general praise for the Obama administration, Stephen's general uh, general uh, non-praise, but I don't. Uh, I'll, I'll provide a different uh, perspective on all this. I was uh, gratified that Steve would say new tools and new structures because I think that's what I will will talk about. Uh, I could have sent Julian Sanchez over here, sent him. I could have asked Julian to, to come over here and talk and he would have said things you'd like about uh, surveillance and, and communications privacy and the war on terror and, and generally. Could have invited Ben Friedman, could have sent Ben Friedman over here and he would have said things you'd like to hear about drones and the, the uh, president's entry into hostilities and things like that. Uh, but, but Ginger persuaded me that maybe I should come and talk uh, about the transparency I, work I've been doing which is general. It's general transparency work. It doesn't, it isn't specific to the national security area, but I think it applies very well to the national security area and will help make the arguments that Tom and Steve put forward and Senator Merkley uh, easier to make, more, recep uh, more received, better received by the public. Uh, we live in a culture of uh, government opacity and in the national security area, that's the culture of government secrecy. Um, I, I wonder, I, m I imagine all of us on this panel and probably many of you in the room have heard somebody say or had somebody say to you, well, if it helps to protect the country, I guess it's all right. That's a crystal clear example of question begging. It's also a dangerous question to ask because I will strangle you if you say things like that. <laughs> but uh, but, but that's, that's somebody speaking about national security issues who doesn't actually care. And lots of people don't care. Now I'm not saying it's right that they don't care, but that's the predicament we face as advocates, advocates for transparency, advocates for restrained foreign policy, advocates for uh, security that's consistent with our values, advocates for privacy. And I thought about this quite a bit. I mean, I work at a think tank, so it's my job to think about stuff, I do. Uh, what is it to care? 
What does it mean to care about something? Why do people care about things? For me, it's really sort of a two-parter. It's something that you have enough access to information about, and it's something that you can maybe do something about. Those are sort of the twin parts of it, what it is to care. So I care about my family because I know who they are, I know what their predicaments are when they have them, and often I can help, or maybe harm less than, than, uh, than I otherwise would if I try hard. You, wonderful people, though you are, don't care that much about my family because you don't even know who they are, much less how to help them anyway. That's fine. That's appropriate. That's, you, don't, you don't care so much. I do care because I have access to the information about them and might do something about it. Well, we're in a bad way in terms of getting people to care about government generally and national security especially because it's hard to find out about what's going on in Washington, D.C. or wherever, wherever the government's operating. And as hard as it is to find out about it, it's very, very hard to do anything about it. So the work that I, that I focused on is, is in the transparency area is generally to try to, change, to try to change that state of affairs so that people have better access to information and so that they can then do something with that information uh, to better their circumstances, better all of our circumstances, uh, to, to, to regardless of what view a person has about what, what our circumstances should be. So. Um, in the national security area, this is particularly hard because I think it comes with a bipartisan or pan-ideological assumption national security does that it's a good thing. Most people want there to be national security, and I don't think it's wrong in some degree to want to, want to have national security. But from my, in my perspective, uh, the national security bureaucracy is just like any other, any other bureaucracy and will have some of the same defects that, that, that other bureaucracies have. Uh, things that we all work on in, in our other lives as well. My friend Chris Preble, I think, is fond of saying uh, to, to uh, needle our Republican and conservative friends that uh, the national security bureaucracy is not an honorary member of the private sector. It is a bureaucracy, and if you're interested in limiting government uh, the way we are, you ought to be interested in limiting the national security bureaucracy, uh, just like all the others. Well. We want to, and, and the Center for Effective Government uh, is, a, is uh, a leader in this area, along with many other groups. We want to have better transparency. We want to change from a culture of opacity or a culture of secrecy to a culture of transparency. Uh, and I think, as, a, as a, a thinker, again, which is my job, I've thought a lot about what, what, what delivers transparency. There's an important, I think, uh, a distinction that, that, that's worth drawing, and that's the difference between open data and open government. Uh, Lisa Elman on the earlier panel talked a lot about innovative uses of data and there's nothing at all wrong with making data available for innovators to use. Uh, there are some wonderful, we've, we've had some wonderful outcomes from, from op open government data, data being made available to people to use. But I think the real heart of government transparency is open government. Uh, and the data that we want actually goes to some very specific areas, uh, which I <laughs> speak of as a sort of a trio, uh, deliberations, management, and results. So if we're getting good data from NOAA to, to play with and make apps and learn what the weather is, that's wonderful. And I'm, there's nothing I want to, I want to say should suggest that that's bad. But I also want to see NOAA's checkbook. I want to see NASA's checkbook. I want to see how they decide what they, what they prioritize. And ultimately, I think the hardest challenge is results. How, are, how, is, this, uh, how is this advancing the goals that Congress put forward when it, when it initially created these agencies or whatever programs that, that they're doing? So uh, how do we get there from here? How do, we get, how do we get open government? How do we get that data that we need about deliberations, management, and results so that the apps we build are really uh, informing people about their government? Well, I've spent a lot of time, and I won't bore you with uh, all, the, all the concepts in data, but, but basically you need data structure. You need identifiers for the key things that, that are involved in policy making and in policy, and you need to understand the relationships among those things. So just a simple, uh, a very simple civics lesson for you, you need, to, you need to know about the major elements in policy making, including in data formats that computers can use, bills, members of Congress, votes, laws, hearings, regulations, and one that I, that I emphasize a lot is knowing about the organizational units of government. What are the agencies, bureaus, programs, and projects? Believe it or not, and I find this astounding, and I hope you will too, 
There is no machine readable federal government organization chart. There is no way to tell computers what agency, what bureau belongs to what agency. Uh, what program belongs to <coughs> what bureau belongs to what agency. Uh, there are some PDF documents out there, and some of them are, are, are uh, decent, at least at the agency and bureau level. And you can turn that into a table and make it machine readable. But there really should be a machine readable master government organization plan so that we can follow uh, what, uh, what goes on in the government. I'll note with particular reference to, to national security that even in uh, OMB Circular A11, Appendix C, where the, where the identifiers for the, uh, for the top level uh, units, uh, organizational units of government are, are placed, uh, the military departments are a jumble compared to the rest of the government. And that arguably, I believe, is because they don't want people to be able to follow the money because that has national security consequences. At the agency and bureau level, the top dumbest levels of government they're actually jumbling information that we would, we would be able to use to oversee these agencies. So that's just the beginning, and I think there's much more as you try to dig into the, to the activities of, uh, in the military branches in particular. But imagine what we could do if we could tell the public stories about policymaking. We try all the time, and that's the, one of the best ways you can convince people of things is to tell them a story. But imagine if you could tell them a story that a, a recent graduate of a high school civics class could understand. There was a budget, House or Senate budget, President budget, I don't care which. There was a budget. It led to the introduction of an appropriations bill. There was a vote on it, and you can find out how your member voted. That vote created law, and it affected agencies, gave agencies money. They obligated the money, and the, the obligation resulted in an outlay to a specific actor that we know who it is. And the result of that was a drone strike in Pakistan. If you had that story, that path from the budget to the drone strike in Pakistan, you could go back up the chain and find out about the vote. How did my member of Congress, how did my senators vote on the law that allowed there to be a drone strike in Pakistan that killed a child? Americans might start to care because they under, would understand how that happens. And they might, might start to do something, whatever it may be, by writing letters, by creating a petition on whitehouse.gov, by just talking to their neighbors. And we'd start to have a culture of transparency, a culture where people do care because they have the information and they have a few ways at least to start to act on that. To try to advance this culture, it's, uh, I feel like I'm talking about a magical world where people actually care. But we're trying nonetheless, and to, try to, 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 to start to produce that environment in this country, uh, at the Cato Institute we've been doing a lot of work uh, to model what legislative process looks like as data. It's kind of a weird thing, but uh, and it's, it's very weird. I've had strange uh, philosophical conversations with propeller heads, data nerds, and library scientists, and information scientists. How do you make legislative process into data? Likewise, the budget appropriating and spending processes. What do those look like as data? Ontologies, identifiers. I need identifiers for the agencies, bureaus, programs, and projects. It's shocking to me that there is no machine-readable federal government organization chart. Sing it with me now. Okay. Uh, but we're not waiting. We're, having identified those needs, and there are a couple of reports that we've put out, uh, we're not waiting around for the government to give that to us because we think we can get more out of the government by doing it for ourselves and showing how it can be done. So we're underway in a project right now where we're taking the bills that are introduced in Congress. Um, they're, they're, they're published with a thin XML. XML is a, a markup language. It's like HTML, which is the, the, the language that underlies the World Wide Web. They're published with sort of thin XML that doesn't tell you very much, a lot of printing instructions. And we're adding rich XML, semantically rich XML, that tells you uh, what existing laws are affected by a bill. We just go and mark it up, highlight it, and click, and the special software we've got will tell you what laws are affected. So Krista Boy talked on the earlier panel about the need to find FOIA exceptions that are buried deeply in bills. Well, I've got interns that do that. They don't know exactly what they're doing, but they see a reference to the FOIA law. They mark it up as such and you could automatically query our database and find out right away every amendment to Title V, every amendment to the, to the specific part of FOIA that you care about. 
We're marking up agencies and bureaus to the extent we can. Uh, there's a pretty good list of them that came out of NIST that actually has unique identifiers that's, that are useful. We're not sure that that's a reliable list because it really doesn't have the uh, authority that we'd like it to have. And we're marking up budget authorities, so authorizations of appropriations and appropriations themselves, along with their purposes and their, and their years, the time frames along which dollars would be available. To start to build that, that uh, technical infrastructure, a data infrastructure, that people can use. The kids at the Sun Life Foundation, uh, anybody, who, anybody who understands data, and I only barely do, can go and build apps that tell people right away, I want to watch, I want to watch amendments to the FOIA law. I want to see what, I, what money is proposed to go to the Department of Labor. I want to see this, I want to see that. I want to correlate spending to votes. Uh, hopefully soon we'll, we'll have people building things like that. And actually this week, because it is Sunshine Week, uh, perhaps most importantly, we're having a Sunshine Week happy hour at Cato on Thursday evening. You're all invited, 5.30 to 6.30. Uh, you're supposed to RSVP, but I don't care. Just come anyway, 1000 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, before that, we're, we're getting people together to work on editing Wikipedia. We're not only working on getting legislative data onto Wikipedia, but our Thursday afternoon session uh, is meant just to train people up on Wikipedia, because everybody who's working in policy could do better to put factual information on Wikipedia for the public to access. Um, so you're all welcome to come to that as well. Uh, we'll try to live stream it for the folks online. You can go to Cato.org live for that um, Thursday. <coughs> then on Friday, we're having a roll up your sleeve session with uh, technical experts, real data people, and Wikipedians to devise ways of automatically or somewhat automatically getting data about what's happening in bills up on Wikipedia. So the public has access to it, uh, starts to build an expectation of knowing what's going on. That's a very small step toward a broader cultural change a culture of transparency around government. So I think that uh, with, with success across the board in transparency, a good thing will happen for my colleagues uh, in the national security area, which is that the relative opacity of the national security bureaucracy will be, will be more obvious to people. They'll start to say, hey, I can figure out what's going on at the EPA. I can figure out what's happening in the Department of Labor. I can figure out what the FCC is doing. Why can't I figure out where this drone program came from? And so more political support will get behind the efforts of, of, of um, folks that are trying to bring transparency to this area. And it will stand out as an area where there isn't enough uh, transparency. This opacity, this secrecy is inconsistent with American values. Uh, we're going to do that all using computers and that fanny, fancy internet with all the computers talking to each other. A couple of weeks, we'll be done. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Ginger, for putting this uh, panel together and, and for the Center for Effective Government for sponsoring us and for the Bauman Foundation for, for hosting this discussion. Uh, and I just want to say at the outset, many of you know this, but the thoughts I'm going to share with you this afternoon are my own, and I don't want them attributed to Senator Merkley um, unless I would explicitly s say so. Uh, so the issues we're discussing today in Congress uh, are primarily handled, as, as these panelists know, by the, the House and the Senate Select Committees on Intelligence. And I just think it's important to note at the outset that there's only 36 members of these two committees, and there's 535 voting members of Congress. So in other words, my quick math shows that there's really fewer than 7% of members of Congress that are really in a position to have full access to the information and, the, and the, the experts in the administration, the documents you've heard references to, uh, on a daily basis. And there's some exceptions to that. Leadership of, of uh, both houses have access. But you're, you're really talking about a small, small number uh, of members of Congress. And that's pretty profound, and I don't think most lay people who don't follow these issues probably realize uh, how small the community is, is working uh, a day-to-day -day basis, particularly conducting oversight over the intelligence agencies. And of course, it doesn't say anything about staff, and, and the staff access is even more constricted. And so this is a very different policy area, if you will, a, a structure than other areas which Congress legislates uh, and has oversight over. Uh, and uh, and I, I think that um, ha certainly has a lot of influence on, on the ability of the institution to, to address some of the issues we're discussing. 
And I just wanted to speak a moment about the Feist Amendments Act, as Ginger mentioned, and I hope all of you are enjoying your, your Christmas uh, dinners and vacations. Uh, but if you happen to have been bored or uh, uh, otherwise turned on the TV and clicked and, and saw C-SPAN, you would have uh, watched uh, the floor of the Senate uh, debate and then reauthorize the Feist Amendments Act of 2008, which is a, a statute which uh, colloquially uh, legalize what we refer to as the Bush warrantless um, wiretapping program. And one of the issues that the senator I work for um, has con been concerned about since he arrived in 2009 is this growing body of law that we often uh, refer to as secret law. In an, uh, any other sort of policy space, uh, when a court interprets a statute, interprets what Congress has, has passed, uh, it's public, and it's public because, you know, democratic governance sort of presupposes that the law is publicly known, which is, is governing w what we're doing. But for matters, uh, for matters regarding national security, uh, and particularly for decisions pursuant to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, the judicial decisions are made by a, a, a court called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or, or sometimes it's called the FISA Court which is highly secretive, and none of its decisions are, are public. So many of the court's findings on a day-to-day -day basis are going to be findings of fact, and they're going to be weighing uh, the facts of a case and making a decision about whether a wiretap should go forward or not. But every once in a while, the court, like any court, will make a decision that interprets the statutory language or makes a significant conclusion of laws as what you may, may hear reference to. The court uh, is required to send over these significant decisions uh, required by statute to uh, the Senate and House Intelligence <laughs> Committees for them, for those members that have access to and review. But again, remember, less than 7% of the body sits on those committees. And even fewer staff have access to these opinions. And I don't know how familiar you are with members of Congress or how often you've worked with offices, but members generally do not have the time or necessarily the knowledge or background to sit and read a 50-page court opinion that's probably quite complex and detailed um, and has none of the nuance that, for example, a staff member may be able to provide. So obviously, with a legislative body like Congress, it's important when you're debating the merits of a proposed law, or you're moving, in this case, to reauthorize a law, to be able to discuss in public how the courts have interpreted, uh, in this case, what is already law. And courts decide all the time. They decide what legal standards mean in practice. They make decisions about structural sort of policies, in this case, what standards uh, uh, NSA may have to meet to, to go forward with a wiretap. The FISA court, we know, has made decisions about what the relevancy standards means in FISA, around what any tangible thing means, which is a phrase in FISA which allows the government to collect business records um, in the course of a national security investigation. And a few years ago, we know, after uh, some prodding, um, that the Obama administration was working on a process to try to declassify these important, legally significant court opinions. But we also know the process has been stalled. Nothing has been released. Um, so Senator Merkley, as this debate was moving to the fore, um, wanting to push this process along, offered an amendment uh, on the floor uh, in late December that would have required the Department of Justice uh, to declassify these, these FISA court opinions. And if they weren't able to declassify the full opinion, um, to at least declassify summaries of these opinions. Now, the amendment uh, had, a, had a vote. It was one of just a handful of amendments that received the vote. It did not pass, but it picked up 37 votes, uh, which, which I, I think uh, is a pretty strong signal that there's interest in pushing this process along, uh, at least in the Senate. And some important members who follow these issues closely, including the Chairwoman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, indicated that, and as she has before, that she's supportive in principle of, of uh, pushing the administration to declassify these significant uh, findings of law. 
So where does this leave us now? Um, you, you know, members are quietly working, uh, following up with the administration uh, and the FISA court to try to see if there's an area where we can uh, push this uh, declassification process along. Uh, as we've witnessed in what was certainly timely for this discussion um, with the OLC memo issue that, that was referenced on the drone sex, there's a continued friction, as there has been for many years, between Congress as a body and the administration around what access is appropriate to, to materials. And, uh, and, and again, even at the committee level, which committees really need access to this information to do their job. But I just want to end in, in, uh, on this note that apart from the, the press discussion around whether members of Congress have access to documents such as legal reasoning for the government to be able to, uh, to kill an American citizen overseas, uh, there's been little discussion about whether the public should have access to these documents. So the first step is certainly having Congress as an institution uh, fully involved, uh, certainly as appropriate. But at the end of the day, uh, particularly in, on, in the FISA example on, on how the courts have interpreted the law that Congress has passed, it's important that, that the public have access to certainly at least the basic contours of what's been decided so they have a sense of, of what law is governing uh, uh, their daily activities. Thanks, uh, and I'd like to thank the panelists again for being here. I think it's great in particular that we're talking about national security reforms in all three branches of government, uh, in the courts, in, leg in the legislative branch, and also in the executive branch. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience, but first I just had a few questions for the panelists myself. Um, first, Scott, what do you think is the likelihood of FISA reform? Uh, are there other secrecy statutes that should be reformed, and how can we as a transparency community help uh, to create the political will for that reform? These are all difficult questions, but I'll, I'll take a, a crack at answering them. Uh, so F FISA Amendments Act has been reauthorized now for five years, and, and I think if history has told us anything, <coughs> uh, it's, it's unlikely, it certainly hasn't happened that in between reauthorizations, there's uh, certainly the, the whole body sort of considers these issues in any formal manner. But I certainly know uh, that the intelligent members of the Intelligence Committee, including Senator Merkley's colleague, Senator Wyden, and, and Senator Mark Udall, have certainly been interested in reforms and continue to, to push the administration. And I think if you watch the Intelligence Committee hearing um, this morning, the oversight hearing with the Intelligence Committee, these issues came up. Um, in terms of uh, what the community can do, it's, it's critical, and, and I think the panel before us mentioned that uh, we, Senators and members of Congress can talk about these issues, but unless the public's engaged, uh, it's hard to certainly get traction, and you're not going to be able to, um, to to really make uh, make the progress that may be may be necessary to, to see movement. So, as advocates on on these issues, uh, certainly educating your members and, and the broader public, and uh, and uh, having uh, sort of your networks. Um, uh, c contact is something as simple as contacting members of Congress is makes a difference in you know having 37 votes in support of Senator Merkley's amendment was a much higher vote count than I think most people expected including you know, other members of the Senate and uh, and one reason for that is there was a lot of effort put into to pushing out information about the amendment to, to, to groups like uh, all of yours uh, as well as sort of the internal inside game of, of speaking with other officers. Great. Um, so, Jim, uh, from a FOIA litigator standpoint and requester standpoint, that big government organizational chart that you talked about, I can't tell you how valuable that would be to us because one of the things that we run into frequently uh, is that some agencies that shall remain unnamed uh, actually have regulations that you have to pick the right subcomponent of that agency to send your request to or your request may not be perfected. Um, this is very problematic from a requester's standpoint, obviously, when you're dealing with large and non-transparent agencies like DOD. Um, not that I'm naming any names. Um, it, it's difficult from an, from an outsider's point of view to identify you know, what even the offices are within that agency, let alone what the correct office would be to direct 
uh, that request to. So I have to ask you, where are we in creating that machine-readable governmental organizational no. chart? I, I really do appreciate your uh, your uh, subtlety in, in, in treating that agency as a, as a private. Starts with a D, ends with <laughs> Department of Defense. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we're not very far along. Uh, I have I hear I hear from time to time that there are projects going on uh, in OMB to try to uh, maybe maybe bring <coughs> uh, bring a uh, produce a list of uh, uh, programs. That would be nice. I think I mean the the government's very complicated about these, but there's sort of a layer cake element to it. Agencies, bureaus, programs, and projects. Uh, agencies and bureaus you can kind of figure out, uh, and so, but some some departments, some agencies like to have exceptions to that. Uh, if there's a, if we get another level, that would be very nice. Then there's a gap from programs. There's a gap down to spending, and you often hear about USAspending.gov and FADS and FPDS and things like that. I don't know that area so well, but there's a strange gap where you can't you can't see from the top level of the cake to the bottom level of the cake where the outlays actually happen. If we can connect all those up, that would be terrific. Uh, there's hope in a, a bill called the Data Act, which is uh, probably soon to be reintroduced. It was introduced in both the House and the Senate last year by uh, Congressman Ice <coughs> and um, uh, Elijah Cummings, bipartisan bill in the, uh, in the Government Reform Committee. On the Senate side, maybe you can remind me. Um, Warner, yes. And he had a bipartisan co-sponsor as well. They're debating how, what to do with this, but basically it would, it would uh, require the executive branch to organize itself along the lines I'm, I was talking about, that is, produce data. If you're going to produce data in open formats, you actually have to have a machine-readable organization chart. It's not going to look like your, your big pyramid, but the, the representation of what sub-agency belongs to what agency has to be there. And so... Uh, should the data act be passed and implemented well, we will have that. We will know the, the relationships among all the organizational entities and the, at least the executive branch. And that's huge progress. It sounds like a silly small thing. But once I've got that, once I've got that list and unique identifiers for each one, I can go and plug it into every bill that's in Congress. And you know accurately what bill is affecting what subunit of, of, in the executive branch. And you can know who sponsored and co-sponsored it. And you can know what committee it's in and so on and so forth. So we're sort of building a data infrastructure for, for government activism that I think would be far surpass what we, what we have today. Great. Um, so to Steve and Tom, uh, assuming that the White House does actually have the political will uh, toward transparency, real transparency, especially on national security issues, um, which is something we're just going to take for granted on this mm -hmm. question. We may have some disagreement. Um, what improvements can be made to hasten the implementation uh, of good Obama administration transparency policies and, and to make that trickle down to the agencies? So what can we as a transparency community do and what can the administration do to hasten that? Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Only oh, easy Steve. questions up here. <laughs> Only okay. easy questions. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, the question I ask myself every day, more or less, is what's working? And as I said earlier, one of the things that's working is independent review of classification decisions by the ice cap. M most of the reviews that they do are reviews of Tom's Don't request, or, you yeah. know, the archives yeah. request of historical documents. But there's no reason that they couldn't get involved in current classification disputes. So I could envision a a you know a, a something analogous to the White House petition.gov kind of thing where people say look we have this issue that we're really concerned about uh, if it meets a certain threshold of public interest it gets kicked over to the ice cap for declassification review and the instructions from the White House to the ice cap are do the most classification you can do. We want you to err on the side of disclosure. The, the originating agency will have a vote, but not a veto. They get a chance to say why the information needs to stay classified, but they, they don't get the exclusive decision. We're going to subject this to a broader range of opinion, 
And if it, if it functions anything like the ice cap process functions, more often than not, there will be increased disclosure. I think it's an experiment worth trying, and it's a way to engage the public in the declassification process and to give them a place to go when the agency, the originating agency, is shutting the door in their face. So I'd like to see something like that happen. I would endorse that because I think that interagency panel, the ISCAP that Steve's referring to, has really shown its value by just removing ownership of the secret out of the cold, dead hands of the originating agency. It actually has moved, uh, what, about 65% of the, uh, the decisions have been pro-disclosure. But I would go beyond, Steve, because I think there's also a learning process that's missing from those good decisions, just mm -hmm. like there's a learning process that's missing from the president's historic declassification decisions. It just has, has not gotten down into the agencies so that they're implementing this, so that they get the word. So, and I'm not sure how quite to address that except by repeated White House um, memos and directives. There's 24 of them listed in the back of this great report by the center. Um, I think we need more of them. I mean, our first Freedom of Information audit that we did after the first year of the Obama administration by the National Security Archive, we could only find 13 agencies that had done anything concrete in response to all those great day one messages on Freedom of Information. Only 13 out of 90 plus. And that made headlines, agencies failing to meet Obama's pledges, right? So then there was a memo from the White House signed by Rahm Emanuel and Bob Bauer. It didn't have any <laughs> cuss words in it or anything, not the usual Rahm treatment of agencies, but it went around to all the agencies, and within a year we could show 49 out of 99 had made some concrete change in how they dealt with freedom of information requests. So I think part of the answer to your question is sort of what's the follow-up? We need more of that. It, yes, 24 directives was great, Where's the next 24? Where's the next 24? Those are those numbers. And, and to me, I would just come back and say, I think the, the heart of the problem really is in the Justice Department and the way in which justice continues to make the old security arguments that were developed during the Cold War. And part of this, I, I understand as a, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I just play one on TV on occasion. But they feel bound by precedents. They cite precedents. But these are precedents that were written by the likes of Warren Berger and William Rehnquist, who brought new meaning to the word oxymoron, Justice Rehnquist. You know, it's just like a contradiction in terms. But these precedents that the Justice Department feels saddled with somehow has kept them from actually internalizing what President Obama, I think, is trying to do what we're arguing for, what a new realistic post-Cold War sense of what threat is, what national security really is composed of, that's not happening. We're got, we've got declassification guides at the Air Force that are, you know, I'm sorry, they were written in 1959. They still withhold the pre-delegation instructions in case of nuclear war. We just got a document from a great ice cap decision that shows Lyndon Johnson was briefed in 1968 that, oh my God, if the president goes missing during some attack on our country, we automatically launch against China and the entire Soviet bloc all of our nuclear weapons. Great. Foreign policy headlined this. Um, if the president goes missing, nuke everybody, right? That was, that was our policy until 1968, and that secret was just declassified two months ago. I mean, this is absurd. We're not living in the real world if that's what we're protecting with our classification system. And Justice Department is defending those claims by agencies in every court case, whether it's our CIA case in the Bay of Pigs, a 30-year-old history about a 50-year-old invasion failure, and they're standing up with a straight face in court and saying, I'm sorry, this would actually damage a real government interest if we, if we release this, this strand of history. It's, it's absurd. And so, to me, the heart of the problem and probably as a litigator, you have to deal with this every day, Ginger, but it's the Justice Department is stuck in making the same arguments, the same litigation postures. There's never been an ordered review of those 700 new Freedom of Information cases. My bet is if somebody actually went in with the mandate to say, look at all those 700 new cases filed in the last two years, can we settle these? What would happen if we actually applied a presumption of disclosure to the claim of the requester? My bet is half those cases could be settled tomorrow. I'd love to put Miriam in charge of doing that process, but, but until justice um, really comes to the real world today, until some grown-up supervision at Justice Department really works its way down the chain, I think we're 
we're going to be battering our head against the wall. From a litigator standpoint, I do agree with that. I mean, it's even worse, actually, than that they're advancing old, outdated precedents. It's that they're creating new precedent that's yeah. even worse than what we had 10 years ago. Um, I encourage everyone to look at the Crew v. FEC case. This is a case where the Department of Justice came out in favor of the FEC at the appellate level. Uh, it basically would make a FOIA acknowledgement. Uh, that is a letter that the agency says that sends to you, a form letter. Uh, we've received your request, we acknowledge it, and we will eventually get to it. Uh, that would be, for the purpose of the act, uh, a determination under the FOIA, and it creates all sorts of very troubling implications for requesters and their ability to obtain judicial review. Um, and initially, it was just the FEC that was putting this doctrine out there. Uh, they took it to court. And we all waited to see what would happen with the Department of Justice once it went up to the appellate level and the judge signed off on this. Uh, and sure enough, the Department of Justice swoops in with uh, an appellate brief supporting the FEC. Mm. So uh, an independent review, perhaps, of the Department of Justice's positions in these FOIA cases would be an excellent way to address this. Uh, and for, for justice to step away from defending agencies that are taking extreme anti-transparency positions would be the next step in that process, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that, do we have we have time for a few audience questions? So uh, I invite you to come on up and go ahead and ask. Uh, I, I'd like for this is Tom Sussman. I'd like for Steve and Tom to answer the second half of your question. They did a great job on what was needed. They need now to give us some insight on how we get there. Well. <coughs> I'll let Steve go first on that yeah. one. <laughs> um, you know, we have three <coughs> branches of government. They have not been um, equally uh, vigorous and, uh, you know, active participants in this process. I think there's a sense in which it's unfair and unrealistic to ask the executive branch to solve all of its problems, you know, by itself. It, it, that's not the way the government is structured. The way the government is structured is everybody fights for their own maximal interests and you hope that at the end there's some sort of decent equilibrium coming out the other side. And what's happened is that uh, Congress has been passive and quiescent to a large extent on national security topics. The courts have been deferential or have been slapped down when they stray from uh, abject deference. And I, I think, you know, we need to um, uh, improve the vitality of our other non-executive institutions. Um, and, you know, then so how do you do that? Well, I mean, everything we do in a way is a, 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 an attempt <coughs> to, to, uh, to engage the public and to, and to build energy into the process. Um, I think we need a clearer understanding of uh, the mechanisms of political change. Um, you know, uh, both for ourselves and for our, our political representatives and others. There are some things that do work there are many other things that are futile and a waste of time. We need a clearer understanding of, of what does work. Um, you know, on classification, it's like, like Tom said, taking it out of the hands of the originating agency. Um, if it's going to be a subjective process, which classification always is, then you improve the process by expanding the number and the, and the, and the variety of subjects who are making that subjective decision. Um, uh, you know, but there, there needs to be a, 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 a clear recognition of the problem and then an articulation of possible solutions. Um, I'm not, you know, the, the, we had a, uh, uh, a report from the Public Interest Declassification Board um, that was an attempt to, to um, identify some solutions. It's, it's sort of on the table now. It's in the hands of the White House. Um, it's, you know, it stops quite a bit short of what some of us had, had hoped for, um, but it's not even clear that it will get a response from the White House, even with its um, limited uh, proposals. There, there's work to be done, and, you know, I should ask you the same question uh, afterwards, Tom. <laughs> it, is a, it is something of an irony that Tom Sussman, who uh, earned the earned from his discussions with the FBI and the White House Office of Legislative Affairs around the Freedom of Information Amendments of 1974, uh, finally the White House told the FBI to stop talking with Tom Sussman <laughs> because 
they wanted that bill to be as bad as possible in order to sustain a certain presidential veto. And I really salute you, Tom, for working through a bill that was as bad as possible and that we are proud of today. It's a landmark of American democracy. Um, you heard, I think, partial answers from each of the panelists. So Scott and I think his boss have done a superb job at some of the messaging of, about our content. To use a phrase like secret law, I think, has a lot of power because that immediately connects to the individual. You don't, you're not going to put, make yourself subject to secret law. And I think that's a real, that debate and the way in which Senator Merkley and others took that on was an actual major advance. 37 votes is quite a compliment in the context of FISA reauthorization. I think what Jim's talking about with uh, integrating open data, making the demands for government to be machine readable, to be open to all, to, that this is very much a part. I see the open data community and the access community as very much totally complementary. I don't think they're different goals here. I think we're all about the accountability, the transparency of the results, the open deliberations, understanding management. To me, I see those communities actually working in parallel and through some of the, the initiatives like Open Government Partnership even together. And I, I, I take what, what Steve is saying very much look at what's working and tout those and tell senators about them. I'm going to have an opportunity tomorrow to uh, testify in front of Senator Leahy and I'm sort of took a few notes to myself on what Steve had to say about whether I'm going to say, Senator Leahy, you really needed to hold up a judicial nomination. You, you wanted to get those drone memos? No. No, he's going to spit at me, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm going to ask you for advice afterwards. But the final thing I think I would suggest is we as advocates need to move the frame of the debate. And this would be my only real criticism of the Center for Effective Government's report. It's just too damn reasonable. I mean, it is self-evident. You walk through those, those pages and these are reasonable things that any decent government manager should immediately go out and do, implement. Um, we need to be a little bit more radical. We need to call for some much stronger and systemic changes on the, on the secrecy fronts. I mean, to address Steve's comment about the boundaries, we've got to move the boundaries. I think we've got to go out there and instead of saying to the Public Interest Declassification Board, well, you know, we do this, we're going to be reasonable and try to work with you, we need to say to them, sorry, that report eh, doesn't even remotely go far enough to really address the crisis that, that we're seeing here. Um, the open data and the open government initiatives that Lisa's talking about, you know, I was part of the OpenTheGovernment.org evaluation report that she was proud of to say there's progress. But if you look closely at that report, which is just a terrific effort, huge amount of work, and is going to be a real model, I think, for civil society groups all over the world trying to hold their countries to the open government partnership process, I think the core message was from all of us in that process that these were commendable first steps. We're not nearly far enough along the road to the real goal that we all that we do share. And it may be part of our role as an advocacy community is to be more radical, move the goalpost, ask for more, demand more. I think that's actually a great place to wrap it up. Uh, thank you all for being here again. And don't forget to check out the events calendar on sunshineweek.org. Thank you.